Welcome to the forum, live streamed worldwide from the Leadership Studio at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. I'm Dean Michelle Williams. The forum is a collaboration between the Harvard Chan School and independent news media. Each program features a panel of experts addressing some of today's most pressing public health issues. The forum is one way the school advances the frontiers of public health and makes scientific insights accessible to policymakers and the public. I hope you find this program engaging and informative. Thank you for joining us. Hello everyone, welcome. My name is Taryn Finley and I'm HuffPost Black Voices Editor and I'm also today's moderator for this panel. Join me in welcoming our panelists. From my right we have John Sylvanus Wilson who was a Senior Advisor and Strategist to the President of Harvard University. Next we have David Williams who's the Chair of the Department of Social and Behavioral Sciences at the Harvard Chan School. Next, we have Stephanie Pender Amaker, founding director of McLean Hospital's College Mental Health Program and a national advisor to the, to the Steve Fund. And last but not least, we have David Rivera, who's associate professor of counselor education at Queens College and also a national advisor uh, to, the, to the Steve Fund. Welcome, you all. Thank you. This event is presented in partnership with the Steve Fund and HuffPost. We are streaming live on the forum as well as HuffPost websites and Facebook and YouTube. This, pro this program will include a brief Q&A towards the end and you can send questions to the forum at hsph.harvard.edu. You can also participate in a live chat happening now on the forum. Colleges are currently grappling with how to address the mental health needs of students. At the same time, there's a growing recognition that students of color have a unique set of needs and experiences and that they are likelier to feel more overwhelmed and isolated on campus than their white counterparts. But they are also less likely to seek counseling. Today, we're gonna to talk about the experiences of students of color and what colleges can do, can do to better support them during that transition period to college and during matriculation. But let's start with a clip from the Steve Fund in which two members of their Youth Advisory Board discuss their campus experience as women of color. I know that for me personally, a lot of, um, there are different pieces of my identity that intersect and kind of um, create an overall reason why my mental health isn't the best some days or some semesters. Um, I know that a lot of that has to do with like just being an out-of-state student. Um, I'm originally from Florida, so I'm going to school in Michigan. Um, being an, a student of color at a predominantly white institution, uh, so again, Michigan State has over 50,000 students and uh, the Latinx community in itself is less than 500 students. Mm -hmm. So we are not um, necessarily a big community at MSU. Um, so when I got there, it was kind of hard to like find my community and find my voice. Um, so that was a lot of my first semester. My mental health was like not in the best spot. And a lot of it was because I didn't see people like myself. Um, also, just being a daughter of far migrant, migrant farm workers uh, was hard because I, you know, I'm, look, I'm used to seeing things differently in my definition of what hard work is or um, what I have to do to get to a certain spot um, differs than that, that of my colleagues. Um, and again, just being you know, a woman of color um, at a predominantly white institution is hard. There are certain things that like test me, challenge me, um, and make unnecessary struggles that my white colleagues don't face. It's a lot of paranoia because you don't know what's next because at the end of the day, you're still a person of color. So it's a lot of anxiety and a lot of paranoia with, and I'm not really into politics, but I know, I know what's right and what's wrong. Yeah. And I know that we're not treated fairly as people of color. Um, we don't get the opportunities that peop non-people of color get. So it's, a, it's just a lot of, especially with me about to graduate in 2020 and go on to get a career, it's kind of, uh, it's really, really anxious to, to think about how I won't be put on the forefront because of my color. 
powerful testimonies. John, before Harvard, you were actually uh, president at Morehouse College, which is a historically black college. And I'm wondering, um, you spent time as, as a student and as a leader at both Harvard and Morehouse. Can you talk about the differences um, that you've noticed, not only as a student, but also a leader? So I was uh, an undergraduate at Morehouse, and when I was at Morehouse, um, I felt seen, I felt heard, I felt valued. I felt like the, the institution itself was custom made for me and there for me. I felt like I belonged. Then I came uh, to graduate school here at Harvard University, and I did not feel seen heard or valued. I did not feel like the institution itself was made for me, um, nor did it feel like it was there for me, and I did not feel like I uh, belonged. Mm -hmm. So I was essentially othered. Um, so that the lesson there is that institutions can have an impact on the quality of the student experience, just by the way they're set up, just by the way they present themselves to students. Fast forward, I become president of Morehouse uh, and now senior advisor to the president of Harvard. And I've shifted, shifted from recognizing the impact on students to recognizing the institutional responsibility to alter that impact, to pay attention to it, to do something about it. So I'm here at a time when mental health concerns are, are like off the charts. And if we recognize that if they're off the charts in general, and students of color uh, are less likely to be aware of the services, less likely to be um, diagnosed, and less likely to be treated, then that really brings into focus the, the institutional responsibility. Uh, we're big fans at Harvard of the Steve Fund because they are all about bringing into focus the institutional responsibility for the experiences of students of color making sure that there are changes institutionally that you can make to change the impact on students as I went through as a, as a student at Morehouse shifting to Harvard. So that's where we are now. I'm in a position in the office of the president to make a real difference at Harvard. And we're partnering with the Steve Fund and with the kind of people we have on the, on the panel here. Yeah, and I definitely want to get into some of those changes and solutions. Yeah. Um, but first, let's get into the you know real impact that discrimination has. David Williams, you've studied this. You've done uh, real and measurable research on how discrimination impacts not only physically, but also mentally young people. Can you talk about these studies and what can colleges learn from them as they start to support, better support these students? I think there's a lot that colleges need to do, but we even need to start <clears throat> before college. So there was a study recently published that looked at 20 years of national data for the United States between 1993 and 2012. And it, found, it looked at the suicide rates among elementary school children in the US. Nationally, the rates were fairly stable, but that reflected a marked decline in suicide for white children in elementary school and a doubling of the suicide rates among African-American children. So what does it mean to be African-American in this society that we have seen a doubling of the suicide rate among children aged 5 to 12 over a 20-year window? And I, I think I have done work with, with one of my former postdoctoral fellows, Dr. Bandisha Tynes, we did the first study looking at online discrimination and its effect on middle and high school children. And what we found was these students in middle and high school that online discrimination, racial discrimination, led to increases in depressive symptoms and anxiety symptoms independent of another measure of adolescent stress and independent of discrimination offline. So just even the online context that we sometimes don't even think about is one source of discrimination for students. And then if you look at studies that have been done among college students, there was one published two years ago that interviewed students um, of color on, uh, at a university campus. And they asked them, what are your biggest concerns? And the biggest concerns of these students was aggressive policing. Am I even going to make it home tonight? 
Um, a, a second big concern was high levels of community violence, and the third one was about financial stress and, and their own concern about them e being able to make it and the stability of their housing. The study revealed high levels of fear, high levels of threat, high levels of hopelessness, low perceived economic um, opportunity for them, and uncertainty about the future. That's a recipe for, for mental health challenges, for being overwhelmed by stress, uh, and so on. And, and there is reason, again, it's not just the students, but the entire society and our entire communities. I published a paper with, with some of my colleagues last year showing that every police killing of an unarmed black person in America leads to worse mental health for the entire black population in the state in which it occurs for the next three months. Mm -hmm. So we are a products of the larger environment. And another piece of the larger environment, I would say, to, to, <coughs> to, to end, is the, the political hostility um, and, and stigmatization um, that is in our current political environment. There was a study done of students in Los Angeles. They were in 11th grade in tw the spring of 2016. And they found that those students that expressed concern about hostility and discrimination against stigmatized populations had higher levels of the use of cigarettes, higher levels of the use of alcohol, mm -hmm. of marijuana, higher depressive symptoms. They followed them a year later, and those who were high also had increased on all of these uh, substance abuse behaviors and on depressive symptoms. So there's a lot that needs to be done at the university level, but we also need to step back as a society and say, what kind of society are we living in? What kind of society are we creating in? Because it impacts on young people growing up in this yeah, context. Yeah, it's systemic. It's systemic, and there are layers to this, Absolutely. as you were saying. Um, Stephanie, you were actually on this stage um, last year talking about the mental health of students. So now we narrow in and we talk about you know this this population of students of color um, and can you tell us a little bit more about why it's vital to think specifically about these challenges and uh, Dr. Williams touched on some of them but how are their concerns like how are our concerns as students of color different? Okay thank you yes it was almost a year ago to the date um, I think within a mental health context it's important um, David spoke about a certain recipe uh, and an important part of that recipe that just for level setting is important to be aware of is that the traditional college age years of between 18 and 25 just happen to coincide with the peak period of onset for major psychiatric illnesses like major depression, generalized anxiety disorder, and so forth. But we also know, and the research is very clear on this point, that stress is a strong contributing factor. It's a robust predictor of the onset of these very same illnesses. So we want to ask ourselves relative to race and ethnicity, what is it that students of color might be uniquely experiencing as stressors? And it's everything that was just mentioned. It's repeated exposure to incidents of racism, discrimination, microaggressions, questions about belonging on campus. And we know, again, the researcher is ve research is very, very clear that repeated exposure to these types of experiences is highly correlated with an increase in psychological distress, symptoms of depression, anxiety, hopelessness. And so I like to say that we can't do anything about chronological age, but we can definitely do something about these stressors. And I want to cite a study that's just about to come out. It's um, a study by Cindy Liu and Justin Chen. And they looked at the American College Health Association data from 2015. And this is a national survey of the health and well-being of college students. And they revisited this d data specifically related to, so disaggregated by race and ethnicity, really focusing in on these factors. And what they found was really concerning. They identified that students who identified as black and Hispanic were just as likely as their white peer counterpart students to report symptoms of suicide ideation or thoughts of hurting themselves, and just as likely to have as many suicide attempts. 
Also, students who identified as Asian, Pacific Islander, and multiracial were significantly more likely to report symptoms of suicidal ideation and more suicide attempts than their white student counterparts. Why is this important? All of the above categories of students of color had fewer recorded instances of psychiatric illnesses. So this is of great concern because it suggests that students of color navigating some of the challenges on college campuses may be working with undetected and therefore untreated mental illnesses while coping with all of the above stressors. So this is a gap, this is a health disparity that we must address and close. And you can't ignore those numbers. David, um, we've spoken a lot about the university's role mm -hmm. in this, but I also want to talk about some of those stressors that Stephanie were just, was just talking about on campus, you know, in and outside of the classroom. Um, why is college life, why can it be so difficult for students of color? Right. Thanks, Taryn, and i um, happy to be here talking about such an important topic. Um, I like to think of myself as having kind of a 360 view of the higher ed system. I've started my career in student affairs, now I'm on the professor's side and I do a combination of both. So I've had a unique, unique perspective into the on-campus and off-campus lives of students and I'm really um, excited about the ecological perspective that's been introduced on this panel already. I think we really need to be looking larger about how different communities intersect with one another to impact the lived experience of the students. and looking at those vignettes that were shared earlier, the, the lived experiences of those two women of color on their campuses of not being seen, right, of not being understood, right, um, uh, rendering them pretty much invisible on campus. I would like to say that those are unique experiences, but they're not. Uh, 20 plus years ago, to date myself, when I was an undergraduate student, I had those similar experiences on my predominantly white campus as a Latinx student, where I didn't see reflections of myself in the faculty, for example. Right? We look at um, disparities um, in education and we find that um, across the board, there are not, there, there, the, the numbers of students in higher ed do not match the percentage of students, of people of color in everyday life in this country. We look at professors, that number shrinks even more dramatically. Um, over 70% of professors are white. Um, only 4% around identify as Latinx, which is my identity. And so what does that send to a student who, let's say, is studying accounting, and they never see a professor that looks like them, right? What, is that, what message does that send to that student? Does it send a message that they belong in that profession, that they're welcomed? Possibly not, right? And so that might have a significant impact on their, not only their immediate well-being, but the long-term trajectory of their career. Uh, the students also mentioned uh, intersectionality, how there are multiple identities that we all manage and maintain and that work together um, in concert to inform the way that we understand the world around us, our worldview. And so we know from the Healthy Mind study that's done annually, it's a study of college student wellness um, across the country, that um, if you're low income, if you're a first generation in your family to go to college, and if you're a person of color, which those three often come together uh, very commonly, that that is a significant risk for developing mental health compromises throughout the college years. And so we have to stop taking a cookie cutter approach to addressing these issues and, uh, and start developing more culturally relevant approaches that are going to reach students where they are. Yeah, and we're gonna, we're, we're gonna shift to those approaches and kinds of solutions. But first, uh, we're gonna look at another clip. Um, this young man's name is Kai Roberts. Um, this clip is from Active Minds, and Kai talks about the stigma of mental, health il of mental illness um, in the black community. I really see Minority Mental Health Month as a great opportunity. Um, my anxiety really reached its peak during, during my college years. Um, and during this time, I experienced firsthand um, the huge stigma that mental health has in the black community, um, primarily for my family. I, I mean, it, there was a moment that my family really discouraged my, my treatment, discouraged me from getting a therapist because they thought I would be blackballed, that I wouldn't be able to get a job uh, coming out of college, um, and that I'll be labeled crazy my whole life. Um, and that wasn't really the case. You know, I have a job right now. Um, so it's really important that we, we talk about it. That was one of the huge things that really kept me from talking about um, my experience. Currently, I'm working. I'm speaking on the Active Minds Bureau. Um, and, and I'm proud to say that I'm no longer actively afflicted by my anxiety, um, primarily due to meditation, exercise, uh, and therapy, of course. Um, these are the things that really keep me calm, uh, and I'm really grateful for them. We have made a considerable amount of progress in bringing mental health to, to the forefront. 
um, making it a very popular conversation within the country. Uh, of course, thank you to the news, thank you to uh, entertainment, um, but there's still more work to do. Um, and I've really dedicated my life to helping to continue this conversation. Uh, thank you. You know, I got a bit emotional watching that because Kai's story is my story. <coughs> you know, I too was in college and I didn't know uh, where to look for help because it had been so stigmatized. Stephanie, when we talk about these barriers, especially in communities of color around seeking counseling for mental health, how can we, how can we play a role in tearing them down? How can colleges specifically pl play a role in tearing them down? Well, f first of all, there's a little bit of good news regarding stigma and mental health on college campuses, and that is that it's lower than it's ever been in the history of this country. And so that's encouraging. We want to keep trending in that direction. But we also know that stigma, as has just been mentioned, um, continues to be a barrier specifically to treatment and to other resources that might be helpful and supportive to students as they're not finding their way on college campuses. Um, Students who are feeling or experiencing marginalization relative to certain aspects of their identity, as the young brother was saying, may be already feeling marginalized due to race and ethnicity. But it might also be um, compounded by marginalization due to maybe um, sexual gender identity or minority status or religion or being a young person who's from a low SES social economic background navigating a campus that's um, predominantly privileged and affluent. For universities, for staff, administrators, and professionals, um, it's incumbent upon us to really work with students. The good news, there's a little bit of additional good news, we don't have to guess about these barriers. We can engage students directly and let them tell us what's getting in the way. We also have a significant amount of literature and research to build upon. So these things aren't known. We want to be careful that we're not burdening students excessively by requiring them to come to us and tell us things over and over again that we already know. But we know that stigma can often be a barrier, but it might not be a barrier. It might be a disconnect, as we spoke about earlier, like a lack of awareness that a certain set of symptoms might actually be a diagnosable and treatable mental illness. It, a barrier might be the perception that, you know, the places that are designed to support and work with me on campus, I don't see my identities reflected in those spaces. And so I question, I wonder whether the staff there really have the multicultural competence that they're going to need to truly understand my experience as a certain student who brings a specific constellation of identity. So it's incumbent, again, again the, the pressure is on um, college and university administrators, staff, and professionals to really actively work with students to identify and remove these barriers. And also, if I can add, in the meantime, while doing that, also let students tell us where the barriers, where there's a lower resistance. So it's important for us to take um, multiculturally informed programming, resources, and services and situate them in the places on campus and among the community where students tell us they already feel safe. Ideally, hopefully, that's going to be in your counseling and psychological services, but it might not be. They might say, you know, I actually feel safer in the multicultural center or in the student union or in the BLGTQA office. Some students are telling us, I'd actually like to have this information accessible and embedded in my course curricula and in the syllabi, which is a wonderful way of conveying to the campus that, you know what? This is a campus-wide priority. It's not just incumbent upon students of color to grapple with these issues. We're gonna make it a focus. We're gonna elevate the knowledge base of our entire campus community and integrate this very important information into the day-to-day -day course curricula. I wanna piggyback off of that, Dr. Williams, because this is, um, 
you know, you cannot have a conversation about what you can do for students overall without thinking about identity, without thinking about like specifically racial identity. Dr. Williams, why is it important that we do include creating these spaces where we can speak and embrace, you know, differences in identity and, you know, racial background? Why is that important in this discussion about mental health? Well, I, <clears throat> I think we have heard from several of the panelists and, and from the, the testimony we've heard from persons speaking um, on, on video as well, that there is a sense of otherness. There's a sense of not feeling that you belong. So one of our challenges, I think, on the university campus, but in our society more generally, is to create safe spaces where people can talk, where people can be themselves, when people can even talk about race and feel free to, to make mistakes and not to get the right word, the words right, and then people jump on you. So we, we do need to think of how we can create safe spaces for, for that interaction that deals with the multicultural context of where, in which we live and where we can really truly learn to appreciate and value each other. Yeah, David Rivera, how do we do that? Especially, you know, we constantly seeing, you know, stories come out about how students of color are being attacked, you mm -hmm. know, not only with microaggressions, but mm -hmm. with macroaggressions mm -hmm. on campus. So how do we reverse that mm -hmm. and make sure that we are creating these spaces where we can talk about race? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So going off of what Dr. Williams shared about the need to create these spaces, these micro environments on college campuses where students can feel comfortable, where they can feel brave, courageous to come and share their experiences in an authentic way is extremely important. When we need multiple spaces, we need spaces that are affinity groups or affinity spaces where like-minded, like uh, students that have the, a similar background can come and, and kind of vent with each other about their experiences that they're having on campus to find that support. Now, I teach group counseling and there's a concept, a therapeutic principle called universality that occurs in group therapy, right? That idea that I'm not alone in this, right? Students are often finding that they're alone in this. So if we can create more spaces to bring them together and hopefully start admitting more, right? And including more student, uh, staff and faculty of color, that can be a part of the issue. So I did some studies on when I was in grad school with my mentor on difficult dialogues, Gerald Wing Su at Columbia. And um, what we found is that most difficult dialogues in the classroom about race um, were uh, instigated by a microaggression happening. And so we need to interact with the microaggressions overtly. We can't let them slide. Right? Um, we also found that um, oftentimes these conversations need to be instigated. So we can't just rely on students taking the initiative to have these discussions themselves. They already are. But we need to um, instigate these conversations on campus by having um, different series. At Queens College, right, teach, we have a, uh, a courageous um, conversation series um, that t focuses on different sociopolitical topics that people often have an issue talking about. If any issue is taboo in society, it's going to be taboo on campus and issues of race sexuality, religion, politics, we know those are kind of taboo topics, but those topics carry significant impact on the daily lived experiences of people, and we just start talking about them more. So instigating these conversations is paramount for institutions. Yeah. Um, John, how do we level the playing field uh, so that students of color know that not only their mental health matters, but also so that they have adequate access to these counseling services? Um, I want to I want to address that, but I also want to say that I'm deeply uh, compelled by all the data from the three doctors here um, and the testimony by um, on tape and and just hearing that reminded me of my my own student days at, at Morehouse. I know you can relate to this. You're yes, a Howard grad, yes. so I. But just imagine uh, going to a campus where you um, I, my residence hall was W. E.B. Du Bois Hall. I worshiped in Martin Luther King Chapel. I could hang out with friends in Frederick Douglass Commons. I mean, the, the, the place said uh, repeatedly, this place is for you. So whereas the student's testimony was that his anxiety spiked when he went to college, mine got erased. It was because the institution sent the signal to me that I belong. So, Fast forward to get to your question. Um, Harvard is now on a pathway to be exemplary in this area. Um, after 380 years, 
<laughs> um, Drew Faust was the president, and I give her a nod, who said, you know, maybe the way we're wired, maybe our hardware, having been designed for a single audience for pretty much three and a half centuries, right? Um, privileged white males uh, from New England, and then diversity uh, in the um, mid part of the 19th century was defined as uh, white males from outside of New England. Uh, and that became diverse. <laughs> so that, that became diverse. And so now, uh, but in the, over the 70s, you get people of color coming in and you get the non-merger merger with Radcliffe. So women and people of color are now in the environment. Drew Faust on her watch as president suggested that maybe the way we have been designed and set up for that audience is not suitable for these new what she called groups previously excluded. And so now we're on a pathway to become Harvard University, to become the recognized leader in what we call sustainable inclusive excellence, all right, by fostering a campus culture where everyone can thrive. And in the back of my mind, that means fostering the kind of campus culture that I experienced as an undergraduate, where I could thrive. I, I did not worry about, they held a crown over my head and expected me, challenged me to grow tall enough to wear it. When I came to Harvard, they held a question mark over my head. And I felt the institution was causing me to ask, do I belong here? I rejected that question because I had gone to Morehouse and I was quite confident. So everything, what we're trying, everything we're trying to do right now from the office of the president is about creating a, a campus where everyone can thrive. And that's the pathway we're on. I, I believe we've done a number of things coming out of the box. We had the largest survey in the history of Harvard, 44,000 people uh, filled out this, uh, 24,000 people filled out this survey, 44% of the campus. We now have data from people all over Harvard that will tell us who feels like they belong and who doesn't. We have strategic plans uh, developing all over campus. We have a culture lab we're standing up. We're doing innovation uh, funding uh, to uh, stimulate ideas coming into us. There's a lot going on in the report that was written under Drew Faust uh, toward the top of the Task Force on Inclusion and Belonging. Their report was pay attention to mental health, all right? We cannot presume, this is where it's particularly dangerous and important. You can't presume that the mental health services you have set up for one audience is suitable for all audiences. So we're now modifying that. I believe Dr. Pender, I know Dr. Pender Amaker is on the committee to help us overhaul what we're doing there. We're also getting advice from the Steve Fund. Um, if I believe, if I don't believe you want me here, I'm not inclined to come in and get your services. All right, so trust is, is how this is going to change. Yeah. Um, Stephanie, you, we can't ignore, you know, students transitioning from secondary schools. I know this conversation has been more focused on students um, who are, go straight to four-year schools, but I'm wondering how can we best um, support, offer um, the support needed for secondary school students aiming to transition to four-year schools? So I love this question because everything that we know from all of the experts here on the panel and this field more broadly around the world suggests that one of the things we have to do is we've got to begin these discussions and this dialogue long before students arrive or get ready to make that transition from high school to college. Uh, so there's a lot of emphasis and energy and enthusiasm about um, working with secondary school students and ensuring that they have the emotional preparedness to make a transition 
to college successfully. We know by definition that transitions are always or can be points of vulnerability for students, whether it's a transition from high school to college, from a gap year to college, a leave of absence for a mental health reason and return to school. These are all vulnerable points for students. And so we wanna make sure that our students have the skill base and the knowledge. We're out there working with partners in the community um, teaching ninth graders, 10th graders, 11th graders, and, and 12th graders what to look for. What are the signs of depression? What are common symptoms of anxiety? Um, we're working with these students. A shout out to the MGH Youth Scholars. They're a big partner of ours in the community with the McLean College Mental Health Program. These students are amazing. They are fierce and, and fearless as they're leaning into these discussions, learning about depression, anxiety, what is it gonna mean? And also, we're putting this in the context of social cultural identities, all of the range of identities that Dr. Rivera was talking about earlier, and helping students at a younger age begin to think about, well, with my individual unique set of intersecting identities, what strengths can I draw upon to prepare me emotionally for the transition that's coming? And relatedly, also in the context of those identities, where might I anticipate some of these barriers? And most importantly, what can I do when I encounter them? What are the skills? And we're working with these, and these students are amazing. They give me so much hope for the future because they love these discussions, they're learning these skills, and they're going out into the world on college campuses all over the country with a stronger level of emotional preparedness for this transition. Um, and all of this, all of these um, factors, you know, from transitioning um, to college to being othered and potentially dealing with a mental illness can leave one feeling really hopeless. Dr. Williams, I'm wondering, how do we combat that hopelessness and instill hope? There's some studies that have been done on with minority students in, in college and in uh, middle and high school that have shown fairly dramatic effects. They, they fall into a, a general category of what we call values affirmation interventions. Uh, they're in, interventions that enable young people to affirm who they are and who they are as an individual. Um, and what the research has shown, they have had dramatic effects on, I mean, the, the effects are so stunning, although they're elegantly done, randomized, controlled trials and all of that, but the effects are so stunning that some people said it can't be true. You, you can't have a single intervention mm -hmm. that leads to improved psychological well-being, that, that dramatically improves academic performance, helps people feel uh, good about themselves, overcome some of the barriers of stereotype threat, um, and, and not feeling that you're capable that, that many students have. So I, I think there are those kinds of resources that that play a difference. Um, your experience also made me reflect on my own experience in, in graduate school. Um, I went to graduate school at the University of Michigan. It was a very elite program, one of the top three programs in my field. At the time, I, there was a certain sense of intimidation that I felt of whether I really belonged or, or not. And it made a difference to me. And I don't, can't tell you how it started, but all of the students of color formed a group of about seven of us, uh, Latinx, um, one Pacific Islander, African American, Asian, and we called ourselves the family. And we met, um, the biggest challenge in our first two years was the quantitative courses, statistical courses we had to take, mm -hmm. where we would spend about 20 hours a week just, just completing the assignments, just for statistics. And we were the family, and our motto was, nobody's gonna fall through the cracks. Mm -hmm. And I think <laughs> that cohort and that support made a, a world of difference. I don't know that I would have made it through without the family. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I love that. Yeah. I love that so much. Um, Dr. Rivera, this next one's for you. Um, how can colleges ensure that campus culture, not only inside the classroom, but also out, aren't reinforcing, how, that culture isn't reinforcing stereotypes? It's mm -hmm. a great question. So 
Part of what we need to do is reconceptualize where these issues are emerging from. For all too long, people of color have been pathologized and marginalized, have been led to believe that they themselves are deficient in some kind of way because of all of the societal messages that have been sent over the generations. How communities of color have been mistreated in the healthcare system. We think about the Tuskegee syphilis studies, for example. There's still a legacy of those studies that are impacting how people of color understand and interact with the healthcare system, including mental health. And so who's really sick? In my perspective, it's the institution that's sick. I think that picture is being drawn pretty clearly by my esteemed colleagues up here. And so institutional interventions need to take priority in addition to developing culturally relevant techniques for the students. And I think that's a way that the institution can help to um, minimize the number of harmful interactions of microaggressions, of, of discrimination, um, of other insidious issues that are embedded within the institution, but the institution needs to take a hard look at itself, identify where these deficiencies lie within themselves, like, like Harvard is doing. I'm really glad to hear that uh, my colleagues are being very open about what's going on here because it can serve as a very um, uh, helpful example to what institutions can do in terms of really centering the voices and experiences of students and of other marginalized folks as well in order to make their institution the institution for them, where they don't have to feel like I'm an outsider, outsider here. As John mentioned before, he attended an institution that was made for him initially, and that's fantastic. But most of our institutions across this country were not made for the marginalized. They were made for the success of the privilege, and they're still kind of operating that way, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Stephanie, could you discuss the Steve Fund's um, equity in mental health framework as a path towards solutions? Sure, the equity in mental health framework is a set of evidence-based guidelines, recommendations that institutions of higher education, administrators, faculty, staff can follow in seeking to create campus environments that are more supportive of the overall health and well-being of students of color. Uh, they were, the guidelines were created by the Steve Fund in collaboration with the Jed Foundation and with McLean's College Mental Health Program. And we surveyed institutions of higher education around, across the country. We surveyed students, we convened experts and um, leaders in higher education. And we also reviewed the literature to really come up with a evidence-informed foundation for these recommendations. Mm -hmm. And so the recommendations are great. Anyone can access them by just going to equityinmentalhealth.org. And there are toolkits now that are evolving in support of the 10 guidelines. And just to give you an example, one of the guidelines is to, a couple of the guidelines, one is to make sure that college campuses are recruiting and training and retaining um, faculty and professional staff who represent multicultural diversity but are also multiculturally competent. Another important guideline is that as we seek to um, explore um, programming that's multiculturally informed, there's some incredible innovative programming happening on these campuses around the country. Um, but as we um, seek and initiate this program, Gramming, we also need to do a really good job of assessing the effectiveness. This programming, did it really move the dial? Is it elevating mental health outcomes or academic outcomes for the students in the ways that we think it, it is, or it might be? Because that evidence base will continue to build upon this very important knowledge base so that we can share this information and continue to get better directed by the research evidence regarding best practices in this very important area. John, what are some resources that you think colleges can benefit from in addressing these issues and moving um, towards uh, more equity when it comes to mental health? Well, I, first of all, the, this panel, the resources, uh, the resourceful minds on this panel um, are, are, are very good. You can listen to this and, and, and probe many of the things being said here. I mentioned the Steve Fund. Uh, they are very resourceful for, for Harvard and I think other institutions, but I, I really do think um, you have to, this has to be an institutional priority, all right? In, in order for anything to happen in this space, we've had diversity in American higher ed for the last 50 years, nobody has gotten this right, 
all right? There are no, there are no institutions that are exemplary. Uh, Harvard wants to be number one in everything else, and we're going to be number one in this. Uh, and we're on that, uh, on that pathway now. Here's what I want to uh, really emphasize. Um, what we're doing right now, what we're discussing here, is so important um, to this entire country because uh, we're, about to, we're making decisions now about the pathway, the direction of the country. And I think there's a lesson from Harvard because we have decided with the task force that I mentioned that uh, we are not going to reverse the diversity that we have. We're going to harvest it. We're going to make sure we get the best out of everybody in this environment. Our current president, Larry Bacow, has said that Harvard has been excellent for 383 years. Uh, but now we're going to go on a pathway to realize true excellence. And you can only get true excellence from diversity. You got to harvest the diversity you have. That's a lesson for the whole country, and Harvard is older than the country. So it's a lesson that we could, so it's the broader vision. And I'm, I'm telling you the best way to get this done is to start at the top. The institutional leadership has to make a commitment to getting this right. And I promise you, the conversations, the resources, all that has to happen in an institution to get it right will begin to flow. But until the leadership prioritizes it, it's not going to happen. We're going to go ahead and move on to um, questions from viewers. Um, our first question comes from Heather. Heather is a health teacher in a high poverty poverty area. She says many students are um, many students are the first in their family to attend a secondary school, and some may be even the first to graduate high school. And this is very overwhelming for many. What are some suggestions for these students to start mentally preparing for this change and some simple ways to deal with their emotions as they transition? David, you're nodding. I'll go ahead and go to you, Dr. Rivera. Some of, uh, excuse me, some of the favorite work that I do, <clears throat> sorry, um, as part of my advisory role with the Steve Fund, is addressing the educational pipeline from as early as possible. As we know, as Dr. Williams shared those alarming statistics regarding suicidality and suicidal, suicidal ideation rates, that we, this, these issues just don't occur once, the per, once somebody turns 18, right? Sometimes there are some other issues that have been long lasting that needs to be attended to. And so when, whenever I speak with younger people that are pre-college, I feel like I have access to a mind that I can hopefully help influence so that they can enter college with some of these tools about knowing how to manage their mental health, developing a regular and frequent mental health checks for oneself, right? Um, having families, encouraging families to start open dialogues regarding wellness and mental health, right? We need, to, we need to start changing the narrative of mental health, and the only way that we can do that is by talking about it. Um, mindfulness is a, a huge thing now, right? There's so many apps for mindfulness. NIH is, is sponsoring uh, mindfulness-related um, uh, uh, research projects, et cetera. Um, I know that um, even kindergartners and, and younger are, are learning mindfulness techniques, and there's a, a lot of wealth within that mindfulness technique that also, also probably originates from communities of color as well, so kind of matches um, their, their cultural uh, practices and, and milieus, if you will. Um, so I think that it's important that we start as early as possible, and there's some very tangible things that we can do. Mindfulness, um, frequent mental health checks, and just dialoguing about these issues overall. Of course. Um, Dan Kelly, who's a reporter slash columnist from the Reading Eagle, says, we hear sometimes that schizophrenia and other mental maladies onset when young people go away to college or get into their late teens and early 20s due to the stress of living away and having to make their own way in the world for the first time. Is the college, exper is the college experience more intense or more likely to cause a student of color to quote unquote snap? Le or less likely or no statistical difference? I don't know the answer to that definitively. <laughs> but, but I would say, as, as has been mentioned, <clears throat> that uh, most mental illnesses begin in adolescence and early adulthood, most. Um, and that's across the board. That's not a U.S. phenomenon. That's globally true in the World Mental Health Program. And so the, the college experience does provide another, it opens another Pandora's box for individuals that are at a stage of life um, uh, dealing with, with emotional challenges. So, 
So I, I think it could make things worse, but, but I also think it's also that stage of life and, and the added um, uh, challenges that individuals face that can be a, a real problem. Yeah. We have a question from Robin who says, we have a diverse staff and have been successful in servicing most uh, constituencies, but it has been some it has been a challenge getting the Latinx students to engage in treatment. We have two clinicians of Latinx heritage, and we also partner with the Latinx advisor on programs. It seems that when Latinx students struggle, they are more likely to go home, which has implications for their retention. Any suggestions for creative ways or programs to reach this population? I can talk a little bit about that one as well. And again, through the Steve Fund, one thing that we find is that it's important to engage friends and family, the peer and family support networks of students, of all students, but of students of color in particular. We find that students of color are more likely to go to their family and friends for support, by and large, than they are to go to a campus resource for support. Only around six or seven percent will actually go see a mental health clinician on their campus. That's too, way, way too low. So what we need to do is engage the natural support systems that are already there and already probably functioning well, but those support systems might not know what to do in terms of uh, supporting their, 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 their children who are dealing with, with wellness compromises. And so the Steve Fund has a number of, of resources in our Knowledge Center. If you go to stevefund.org, um, a, a couple webinars that address how parents can support their students of color during the college years and through the transitions that they're, that they're going through. So a lot of it is just a literacy in a way, right? Mental health literacy and promoting that across the communities that are already there, already ready to engage and support the students naturally. I think what you see happening, um, particularly in, in, in that answer um, from Dr. Rivera, I, I think, and it's just like David's uh, answer, that we find ways to cope as communities on these campuses. And, and I do think it's good, but I don't want that to be a reason to bypass the institutional responsibility. I, re I started my career at MIT, and uh, after a few years there, the um, head of uh, career services, one of the services office, came in, we, we were having this discussion, a group of us, and he was frustrated because the students of color do not use, were not using his office as much as others. And it was pretty consistent. And at one point I, I simply said, they're probably not coming to your office for the same reason why they're not going to that barber shop in the student center. Because they can just look and it won't be instinctive for them that there are people, if all the barbers look like Donald Trump, for instance, the, the <laughs> people are not gonna be inclined to come in, they're not gonna guess that you know something about me. Right. So right. if you shift that to the medical realm, boy, there's high risk in students struggling deeply and not trusting the offices that they may or may not be aware of are there uh, to help them. So it's the institution's responsibility to lower the barriers and not leave the healing to our sub-families when we get together. And I, we did that at Harvard <laughs> in graduate school, sure. It was, we, we kind of recreated our Morehouse experience. Because I, I knew that that was the most psychologically wholesome four-year period of my life and I knew where it came from. It came from the sense of family yeah. that we had and you know everybody was supporting each other. So yes, yeah, students are gonna continue to do that, um, but the institution has a responsibility mm -hmm. to facilitate that and to be that environment. So we're not looking for these pockets, these safe spaces. Mm -hmm. We want the whole campus to be a safe space, the whole community to be a safe space. That's a good segue into the next question, which comes from Bianca. How can we hold institutions accountable to improving the care of students of color that have failed to follow through? Uh, <laughs> um, I do, I really do, I, I go back to the issue of an institutional priority. The accountability has to start at the top. The president, uh, the board, the leaders of the institution have to care about this. I think there's, I turn to the demographic imperative. Um, you know, look at the country, uh, look at the constitution of your campus, look at the makeup, and 
if there is a disjuncture, ask why. If the academic performance rates are different, uh, ask why. If the graduation rates are different, ask why. You could do a survey, as Harvard did, and find out whether people are thriving or not. And if your survey is as good as ours, you'll get some indicators as to why that is or why that is not. So you have to, it starts with caring about it. And I believe the accountability comes when enough professors, enough staff, enough students uh, challenge the leadership to get this right. Mm -hmm. um, I we just want to just yeah, we'll go ahead, go add ahead. that like, we saw that happen nationally in this country. It was just truly a watershed moment in um, the mental health of young people of color. In the, in the academic year 2015 and 16, students of color really made their voices heard around the country. They began protesting that their needs were simply not being met um, on campus. And for the first time in the history of this country, as was mentioned briefly earlier, but I think we can't emphasize this enough, students of color placed mental health needs and concerns on that list. Um, so that was a driving force. You better believe that there was accountability. Campuses were reaching out, scrambling to figure out what do we do? How do we respond to these students who are rightfully so really distressed about not having their needs met in this realm? Uh, and so it, it's really a powerful moment that I think has really helped to turn the tide in this area. Definitely. Unfortunately, that was the um, time for <laughs> questions, but I do want to wrap with a key takeaway from each of you on what colleges and um, can do or can how colleges can benefit from or a takeaway or a solution rather that you hope that today's viewers um, get from this conversation. We'll start with John. Yeah, sure. Uh, David. So I, I talked about narrative already. Um, as a therapist, I, I, I rely on narrative uh, therapy and theoretical principles, um, knowing that when we think about mental health for people of color, there's a certain narrative that pathologizes, overly pathologizes people of color, invalidates people of color, um, takes a univer universalistic um, perspective treating people of color through a colorblind lens, right? And that just causes more harm. So my takeaway and, and kind of a challenge is that we need to, to change this narrative of mental health for people of color and for everyone by talking about it more overtly, right? Having it a part of, someone mentioned having it on a syllabus, right? Um, encouraging um, people to discuss their mental health needs, um, their mental health um, uh, stories, Right? My, my idea of mental health and healing is not the same as anybody else. So taking a culturally relative, per, or culturally humble perspective where I'm going to want to first understand the perspective from the person I'm working with. And so I encourage everybody who's either here or watching this to have at least one conversation about your mental health today. Right? One conversation. That can have a lot of power for you cathartically in terms of releasing something, but it can be a great role model for somebody else to possibly take that first step to seek out support. Stephanie? That's really a great idea. Um, one of the most effective ways of reducing stigma is hearing directly from people like the lived experience of the young brother and the young people who spoke earlier today. I wanna, my takeaway is specifically for students, and I want to speak to any student um, who's tuning in uh, to, this, uh, to this panel. Any student who might be experiencing um, a level of distress that's persistent or that's so significant that they're having difficulty functioning, if they're feeling persistent feelings of hopelessness, thoughts of hurting yourself, urges to attempt um, suicide. It's important to know that you may very well have a common mental illness and um, it's not your fault. These illnesses are very common and they're very treatable. And so I want to encourage you to remember that you earned the right to matriculate on that college campus within that college community wherever you are and strongly encourage you not to let anyone or anything get in the way of receiving the proper support and potentially treatment that you deserve. I would add two things. One is I, I think we need to understand mental health uh, comprehensively 
in, in the larger context of individuals' lives. So we do need to provide a treatment and so on, but we need to think what we do with the larger environment. How do we build uh, job readiness and service learning opportunities so that individuals feel empowered and feel they have skills to look to the future? And my second challenge, specifically for universities, in this moment of US history, universities need to exercise greater leadership in, in confronting some of the myths and mythologies and the environment that's creating all of this hostility. I, in the last six months, I have become a member for I don't know why, I receive every three or four weeks an a, a email from a white supremacist group. Um, it, it's a long diatribe. What is disturbing about it is that it appears credible. They're citing studies, they're citing sources, they're citing newspaper articles. If you read it, it looks completely reasonable and evidence-based. What are we doing as academic institutions to confront this diatribe that's out there within our <coughs> communities and within our larger societies? And I would close with, uh, I would speak to institutions as well and institutional leadership and, and say that institutions are like individuals that is, uh, who we were is still a part of who we are. And if most institutions that we're talking about here were born in a time of segregation and racial hate and we were kind of situated that way, then we need to examine ourselves right now and discover the degree to which who we were is still part of who we are and make sure that we are now positioning everyone who comes to our campus to thrive. Thank you so much. This was such a powerful conversation. Thank you all panelists. Thank you all in the audience and at home for tuning in. Um, please join us for our next forum, Drug Resistant Infections, <laughs> Confronting an Escalating Crisis, which will be on October 11th at noon. Thank you all. <laughs>